we haven't got a small topic at all, really, <laughs> how the future's <laughs> going to look. Um, but we'll try and sort of bite off a couple of pieces of it. Um, Genevieve, just let, let's start out by hearing about the kind of work that you do. Tell us what you do. <laughs> in three words. Um, so I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, so my job is to study people, what makes them tick, what they care about, what frustrates them, what they're passionate about, and then think about how you use those insights to drive next generation technology development. So basically my job is, at one level, to make technology safe for people. Mm. So interesting combination of anthropology and tech. Absolutely. Yeah. And Iman? I find it interesting that Genevieve uh, emitted the title Futurist from her <laughs> job title, which is actually there as well. So oh, you're just teasing me. <laughs> makes yes. me feel better about being on stage with a futurist. Uh, I'm the Director of Applied Technology at Finch. Uh, we're a production company, traditionally a film production company, uh, but we're uh, quite young, six years old uh, this year. Uh, and we uh, traditionally focus mainly on uh, storytelling, television commercials, long-form entertainment, feature film, uh, but my department focuses on technology and technology innovation. So uh, I have a team of uh, full-time engineers uh, and we work with advertising agencies and with clients to not only find innovative ways to tell their stories, but also in many cases develop new innovations that are relevant to their business. Mm. Um, Genevieve, you've talked about the tension between the kind of language that we use around the concept of technology, you know, rapidly changing, fast-paced, exponential, all those sorts of terms, and the fact that our nature as human beings is to evolve slowly, and we sometimes forget that. Um, how do you reconcile those mm. things? I know that's a particular interest of yours. Yeah, I think it's always really easy to be seduced by the language of the pace at which technology moves, that we end up talking about that as though it were the way things must be, that you know, technology will change everything, we're all going to be different. And I think you've heard a lot of speakers on this stage today reflect about some of the anxiety that accompanies technology adoption, and I think it's partly because we have that sort of fear about what will it mean. But the reality is the things that human beings have cared about have changed incredibly slowly. And in fact, the things that we care about are often the things that drive our desire to adopt new technology. So does it let us connect us to our friends and family? Does it help us find a community that shares our values? Does it help us tell a good story? Does it help us say something about who we are to other people? Those things are things that have made us human for, I would argue, decades and even centuries. And the technologies that fit into that are ones that you know, tend to survive. It's also the case that there's a series of um, things we've been trying to solve for a long time, you know, whether it's about the tension between a desire to keep certain things about ourselves private and a desire to sort of share good things with the world, notions about security, where you know, anyone who thinks about security from a tech point of view will say the worst part in a security system is the human being because they can't be trusted. But of course, the reality is those systems need to work with us. So there's always a sort of a tension between how hard do you need to make the password for it to be useful and how hard do you need to make it so that you don't forget it. Yeah. And I think there's always those sort of interesting tensions, right? But for me, there's something really important about how do you start with people and imagine that what they care about and what they want and what they can't yet do ought to be things that drive technology development, not always just, I've invented something, now tell me what to do with it. Mm. Um, Imad, you're a professional, were a professional poker player. Is that, is that right? And you're giving me... How does, yeah. how, does that, how does that segue into a career as Director of Applied Technology uh, for a technology-based production company? How, how much time do we have left? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I innovated on my life. <laughs> um, I, I started many years ago in a very boring area of technology in network engineering. So. I used to uh, develop and support uh, medium-sized networks for, for businesses, did some stints at National Australia Bank and Telstra. Uh, and while doing that, I, uh, I started, started playing poker, started playing online poker and started doing quite well, uh, and then reached a point where uh, it didn't really make that much sense to keep working and play poker. Uh, so I just started playing poker. I don't know how else to say it. I, I did well, uh, and then uh, and then I picked up a sponsorship deal with uh, PokerStars, uh, which is the largest online poker site. Uh, and then during that time, I met a man called Rob Galuzzo, who's probably hiding in there somewhere, uh, who at the time was the managing director of at Radical Media, uh, which is a fairly large production company, global production company, and he was running the Sydney office. Uh, and we'd constantly have very strange. Uh, aggressive, weird talks about 
advertising, marketing, technology, poker, obviously. Uh, I was I was always, I stayed on top of the tech side of things quite a bit as well. I did a bit of freelance work uh, on the side and, and did a little bit of um, interesting work in the production side. They, they were shooting a, um, a show called The Poker Star, which was like a reality poker show. And I helped build a couple of the algorithms they used to do um, the tournament ranking systems and chip management and things like that. So kind of found a way to stay involved somehow. And Rob, Rob had always said, you know, if you ever get done with poker and want to get back into tech, let me know. And there was a perfect star of stars aligned moment where Rob decided to leave Radical and set up his own shop and Poker Stars was getting sued by the Department of Justice. <laughs> uh, um, so, so that was a... That made it an fortunate interesting time. It did, it mm. did. So Poker Stars said, yeah, we're not sponsoring anyone anymore. Uh, and so I was playing on my own for about six months and I'd been doing it for six years and, and it sounds great and it is great. I mean, you travel around and you play a lot, but after a while it gets a bit taxing. So uh, it happened, happened at the same time and so I moved from Melbourne to Sydney and started focusing back on tech, but more in a creative way. Yeah, we'll get onto that in a moment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the work you're doing on artificial intelligence, uh, what you're looking at in relation to artificial or to AI. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about the work you're doing? Yeah, and that's actually, I'm, I'm happier with that segue. I thought you were going to ask me how I got my job at Intel because it involves a man in a bar. And, it's really <laughs> <laughs> and I heard it last night. And it would and make it's really Imad, interesting. It would make she'll Imad, tell you that later. Make Imad feel better about <laughs> poker to technology because bars to tech are also good. Um, yeah, so as part of my job, what I get to think about is sort of where is that, again, that intersection of people and technology? And clearly, each new successive wave of technology, you want to ask new questions. And we've really spent the last couple of years in this kind of transitional period of talking about things like robotics and machine learning and artificial intelligence. And for me, I'm really interested in how do we ask some critical questions about AI as it is poised to become a, a really kind of important infrastructure. And, you know, as someone whose background is in the humanities and social scientists, I want to kind of ask, well, where did it come from? Like, you know, when did AI start as a conversation? The answer is, you know, 1956 at a conference at Dartmouth by a bunch of kind of computer scientists, early computer scientists, mathematicians. Then you kind of want to ask, well, whose ideas about what was human are nested inside mm. that, right? You know, what was the human intelligence we were tr imagining we would replicate back in 1956? And the answer is that that particular collection of scientists were heavily influenced by Skinner who is an American behavioralist psychologist who believed that humans were basically electrical inputs in, out, you know, electrical outputs out. And that's a lovely mechanistic view of humans, but it's a bit limited. And it's been subject to a lot of criticism since, and frankly, it was a reaction to, well, Freud earlier. So there's a bit that says, if you're building your notion of what it means to make humanness digital on a notion of humans that is machine-based, there's all this other stuff that's missing our emotions, our unconscious, our subconscious, our irrationalities. And some of those things are actually really powerful tools that you might want to insert back into that conversation. Mm. How do you do that, though? I mean, there are a couple of interesting points in what you said. You know, one is who is doing the inputs with AI is, is a critical issue. <coughs> and but how do you build those? Those, or can you build those human elements in? Yeah, I think you can. I mean, part of it just comes from being stubborn. I mean, I think, you know, um, one of the guests, Andrea, here earlier said that, you know, she was driven by frustration, and I totally understand what she means. Sometimes it's about, you know, how do you bang your head against the wall one more time? And I think there's a piece that says part of what we ought to do as technologists is be aware of our own histories. So, you know, where did things come from? And it's tempting with technology to imagine it just appeared and it has no history, mm. but I think there's a reason to tell those histories. So part of it is how do you remember where the histories are? I think part of it is how do you ask the critical questions about what is assumed in all of this? And then I think particularly with artificial intelligence and machine learning, there is room to start asking questions about what is the data we are using? What are the models we are applying to that data? And how are we weighting all the various inputs? Because frankly, in all of those, there are moments where we make assumptions about the way the world is that maybe are not the way we'd like the world to be, and that sometimes are even bringing with us old ideas that we should shed about everything from race and class and gender and sexuality to notions about how you parallel park a car. And, you know, embedded in all of those sort of ideas about artificial intelligence, there are also human ideas about the way the world works, and I reckon we should take a moment to kind of ask whether those are the ideas we want to carry forward with us. 
I heard Stephen Hawking on radio early this morning saying that AI could be the best or the worst thing to happen to humanity, uh, but we don't know which yet. Do you have a sense of which it might be? Uh, listen, I think most technologies are accompanied by a narrative that goes something like, it will be the best thing ever, it's going to kill us, to, oh, that was it. And it's kind of the yay, boo, uh-huh, you know, got in a hype curve. There's a particular fear about AI, though, in, uh, you know, the way that it's yes described, the media, what it could lead to, all that kind of thing. Yes and no, but that particular set of fears are as much about our cultural imagination as they are about technical fact. Mm. I mean, those are fears that are rooted in a hundred years of science fiction that gave us everything from Frankenstein to the Terminator, so really 200 years of science fiction, which then themselves in turn are based on hundreds of years of cultural narratives, think Gollum and beyond, about what it means for humans to bring things to life. But those are also fears that have a particular trajectory in the cultural imagination. If you were to go look at the narratives about human beings and bringing things to life. They look different in the Hindu tradition, they look different in the Japanese traditions. There are other ways of thinking about what distinguishes people from everyone else and there's not always a bright line the way there is in the Western consciousness. Mm. Imad, I want to talk to you about VR because I know that um, there's a lot of buzz around that at the moment and you're particularly interested in it. Can you tell Tell us about some of the ways that VR is being applied at the moment that excites you or, or the ways it could be applied that excites you. Yeah, I mean, VR is an interesting one. It's an interesting segue into AI. If we had time to follow it through, we'd end up there just finishing up from, from the AI conversation. I find it really interesting because I think the most powerful fear we've got right now is the fear of the unknown. I mean, I remember the Y2K bug was going to kill everyone yeah, that's right. for quite some time and then n literally nothing happened at all. And, and I get that AI is far more important and, and bigger and the orders of magnitude are, are larger, but what's scaring us the most now is, is simply the unknown. And, and we have this um, constant fear of, of the future and big things that are going to happen and don't realise that there's all these small things happening along the way that actually get us there. And it's, it's very unlikely that one day we're going to wake up and there'll be AI. We, we might wake up and there'll be an intelligence explosion and singularity and everything. That, that's a whole another scarier beast. But um, <laughs> it's more likely that we'll, we'll progress there. And I, and I think virtual reality is a really interesting, exciting one as well because VR's been around, I think it was coined in like the 40s, mm. probably not, like uh, before, before they could even 60, simulate VR. 65. It was first made in 65. So the first version was made tubes, mirrors in 65. The, the term was coined before, like it'd been thought about. And then since then... But it's then, really taken off It's ramped. relatively recently. Definitely. It's really taken hold. Definitely. And, and the, the one singular thing that's caused it to ramp, if you had to pin it to anything, is actually the mobile phone. That, that's what's caused mm -hmm. it to explode. Because uh, before then, it was very hard to get a high-quality visual device with processing power in a small enough form factor that could sit on your head that's accessible to the masses, but, but people had been doing it. It's been iterated on year on year for quite some time. Uh, and then Oculus came out and they literally put a Samsung Note, we'll probably never do that again. Yeah, I'll yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, headset. And, um, and they said, hey, here's, here's, here's an amazing new VR. You can and, and blow up your head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, it, um, and it is amazing and it's whimsical and it's wonderful, but it's been iterated on to get to that point. It wasn't mm. an explosion. What about so the applications of it, though, now, do yeah. you think? I mean, where, where are the areas that you think it's most exciting? Yeah, so I, I think there's, uh, there's two places it's kind of going now. We, we've seen a lot. That, I mean, the work that was on earlier is fantastic. There's a lot of um, single-user empathy-driven work that's, that's being done, which is great, or putting the user uh, with, with the feeling of whatever the sensation is. So there's a lot of action sports. Uh, there's dropping a person in a situation they might not normally experience. And then the other side of it, which is, which is a side I think has the most growth, is the interactivity. So um, I, I don't believe that there's much longevity in 360 video uh, as a medium. I don't think many people are going to want to go home and kick off their shoes and watch a three-hour Scorsese movie in VR. It's, yeah. it's, it's so uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, your, your need to look around is, I mean, I'm sitting here on stage, I've got zero need to look behind me. Um, and in most ways you consume content, you consume it in front of you. So the times when you do want to look around, uh, high engagement, interactive mm. time. So, I mean, you could call it a game, but what we're finding now is 
people are taking gaming elements out of the game world and starting to interact it into storytelling elements and the two wor worlds are really meeting in the middle and then once we bring augmented reality into the mix then mixed reality into the mix which is instead of completely replacing a person's reality or supplementing it um, that's where we're going to see the most amount of growth so it's it's uh, incremental improvements to what we're already seeing, and I think a highly interactive version of that, less of a consuming content. Mm. So just a little bit more about the, the, the way that you're seeing this develop and how you think it'll affect the way we interact with each other in the mm. future, the kind of technologies that you're looking yeah. at. I mean, it's interesting. I, I can't wait to see what Facebook ultimately does with VR but, and, and what Apple ultimately does with VR. They're going to do something. Um, Apple's a fun one. They don't come to the game unless they can completely revolutionise something. Um, I think it is going to be a, a social tool more than it is a one-to-one -one tool. Um, that's that that much is clear. I think when we look at, um, I mean, as Genevieve was saying, as as humans, you know, that there's certain things that we're used to and certain things that we look for in technology and that we expect. And I think the social dynamics are a huge part of that. And in ev every form where we, c where we interact with or consume content, there's a massive social element to it, whether it's everyone sitting on the stage here watching us, um, so that afterwards everyone can talk about it and, and, and share in the experience. If you go to a cinema, if you watch something on TV, talk about it at work. I think uh, VR is a bit too focused on that single user experience at the moment, for obvious reasons, it's a headset. But we're starting to see more multi-user experiences. There's, there was an amazing piece of work out of the States for Lockheed Martin, tenuous brand link, but amazing bit of tech, where they turned a school bus into a VR school bus. So they replaced every window with screens and they mapped an entire uh, city in Utah, I think it was, and then turned it into what Mars would look like. And the kids drove around and it switched from a real world to a, I can't click, to a uh, Mars world. And, um, and now all of a sudden they're on the face of Mars. And that, that is a virtual reality experience. And it, it was an experience that everyone got to share in. And I think that's where we're heading. Mm, what do you think um, about the way that it's going to affect uh, our interactions with one another, Genevieve. Yeah, well, I was lucky enough to see collisions down in Melbourne uh, 10 days ago, and I mean, it was extraordinary. I grew up near where that was filmed, mm, so there was something. Extraordinary. There was sort of something about being back literally in that country. I was saying to Imad when we were backstage, the only thing that was missing to me was the smell of the desert, and those are rare moments when you feel something quite so completely. But it was also incredibly strange to be in what was a remarkable piece of storytelling and know you were surrounded by other people but have no idea how they were responding. Mm. And I took the headset off at one point because I wanted to see everyone else and it felt so strange to be so in that narrative and have no sense of the bodies around me. And I think there is this piece where as humans, as much as we sometimes get cranky with the people around us, that's what makes us human, right? It is our relationships to other people and that sense of both the physicality of it and the kind of the constant in it of it that turns out to be really important and it's what's driven all sorts of technologies. I mean, you know, we can talk about smartphones as productivity tools all we like, but the reality is what they're most letting us go is go, hey, what are you doing? Yeah. I'm here, what are you doing? And there's something about that that turns out to be a constant important thing and my suspicion is in the, the sort of virtual reality, augmented reality space. I'm with Emart. I mean, the virtual reality stuff is fascinating and the technical challenges there are immense. But the augmented reality is where, in some ways, for me, the real promise sits because it lets us be in the world but add things to it. And it has, you know, what is in some ways, you know, the kind of critical other promise that we don't always focus on about technology is that it has to have a little bit of magic. It has to feel a little bit like it's something you couldn't have done before and that that something has to have that kind of quality to it, right? I mean, Arthur C. Clarke. And now we need to keep having that. Yeah, yeah, well, Arthur C. Clarke used to say that any new technology, you know, was sort of indistinguishable from magic, right? And, you know, when I think about my great-grandmother who grew up in, you know, Croydon, when her house was electrified, she used to think electricity was pretty cool. Mm. You know, she'd wander in and turn on the light, and you're like, look, electricity, and then turn it off again. And I can kind of see how electricity was kind of magic. And we take it for granted now, and I think there is a kind of, some of the technologies that seem magical to us even 10 years ago. I mean, touch was kind of a remarkable thing when it turned up on small screens. Mm. And we're all a bit blasé about it now. Blasé about Siri too. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Self-driving cars that are already on the road. Well, yeah. you know, we've been talking we've about talk, self-driving cars. We've talked a lot about, we've talked a lot about the pros, and there are obviously just 
massive pros. What, are there cons that you worry about? Are there things uh, that you <laughs> are concerned uh, about? With I'm a yeah, I'm a born skeptic, and uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> look the the cons. Um, I did a whole talk on it, and it really depressed the whole crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Something to look forward uh, to, everyone. Here we um, go. A, a very quick, not too negative summation, but still a bit, is that um, there's there's a, something happening in, it's been happening in video games for a while, right, which is forcing an addictive behaviour mm. in a game. Mm -hmm. and, and it's getting bigger and bigger and worse and worse. And, and I think we saw an explosion of it with mobile games where you want people to make microtransactions and you want to keep them on the hook. So you start doing what's called time gating, where you get someone engaged, get them playing as much as possible, and then restrict them with a physical amount of time before they can do something again. Uh, and you see it as well in MMOs, massively multiplier online games, where they really force that. And it's because they're pushing their subscription model and they want people, they're, they're not trying to sell you the product once, they're trying to sell it to you every day for as long as possible. So, I mean, there's, that's a bit dangerous <laughs> already, and, and then the, that's used in gambling as well and in poker machines. What scares me a bit is that I honestly believe that within 15 years, I used to say 15 to 20, I, I think it's 15, uh, we will have a virtual reality experience that is indistinguishable from reality. Like It, it, it will be reality. We'll, we'll have vision that is so good it might as well be your real vision. There will be sensory replacement, whether that's chemical or neurological. Uh, Samsung's already making devices that you can put on your ears that manipulate your inner ear to... Uh, change the way you believe you're moving in space, it, it fixes your balance. Um, I, I think 15 years we're going to have it. So what scares me is when those two come together a bit and when that happens and some people's motivation to keep people, whether it's a workforce or large sections of the population, matrixy style, uh, extremely docile, and yeah, we know your life's bad, but here have this virtual reality experience and then a person is less motivated to improve their life, uh, I guess, because of it, which which scares me a little bit. No wonder it depressed well, everybody. It, yeah, and, 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 paper. And that was tried to keep it light. And that was the mildly depressing version? Yeah, it, okay. that talk went for 40 minutes. Oh God. <laughs> Genevieve, the cons. I don't want to be negative, but I think it's worth, <laughs> no. worth exploring and what you think yeah, the cons are. Yeah, no, and it's funny, and mine are actually surprisingly different than oh, that. Great. Those are depressing too. Um, I mean, for me, I think there's a kind of a couple of critical questions, right? One is, and one is, that it, it's a, it's an adjunct to yours, which is that as technology moves into more and more places in our lives, I think there are questions that we ought to be asking, and I think they ought to be framed not for us as consumers, but for us as citizens. And they're questions about, you know, how do we inhabit a world of algorithms and smart machinery and an internet of things where it is as much about private and commercial enterprises as it is about civic and civic and citizen organizations and I think there are ways where we know that technologies in the last 200 years have reproduced rather than challenged ideas about inequity and where it lies you know whether those technologies reproduced uh, uneven uh, sort of notions about race or class or gender or sexuality or national status I worry that we have a new set of technologies that will do the same thing partly because who's involved in making them I mean, for better or worse, while Advance gets points for how many women and sort of diversity they have managed to put on this stage, we know that that's unusual. You know you and I work in fields where yeah. I'm still routinely the only woman in the room, and that's kind of crazy. Mm. And I know that, you know, we have technologies that aren't good at managing other kinds of diversity and difference. And so my kind of anxieties are as much about what is the world we are leaning into but not criti being critical about. And then I think there's a second order of pieces, which is how do we then manage a set of issues around uh, a world of data where we ought to be thinking about privacy and trust and security and risk, but also about how do we demand transparency? Transparency of the algorithms, transparency of the data sets on which the machine learning is built, transparency on the motives. Mm -hmm. And I think those are questions for our regulators, but they're also questions for all of us, both for Imad and I as producers of technology, but for the rest of us as citizens who live in worlds where that technology is coming. Mm -hmm. And they're hard conversations to have, right? And that goes back to the point you started with about Skinner at the start of the whole process um, yeah. with AI. You yeah. know, and, and where... Who's doing the inputting? And, and how do we 
work very hard to make sure that those inputs are as representative of a world we want to build as opposed to the world that we're in. Mm. Which means being clearer, I guess, in some ways about what we're up to. Not just in a, I want to make something that's commercially successful, but then there are questions about, and what will the world look like when it's done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is that a world we want to inhabit? And if it isn't, where would we need to intervene in all of these processes to create something different? Yeah, very interesting and big questions. Where do you think Australia is at the moment on the technology and innovation front? How do you think we're positioned? I'm going to throw you under the bus. Aren't you kind? Um, or the autonomous driving vehicle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It, it, you and I were sitting up stage when the, the bar chart came out about innovating, mm. stagnating and unsure, and you and I were both in some ways surprised by how much we didn't think of ourselves as being innovative. Yeah, um, other than Australian Which is not a good way to think. Know. Well, no, yeah. but it is a cultural thing, right? I mean, yeah. as an Australian who's lived abroad and studied abroad for, God, nearly 30 years, I'm always struck by the ways in which we take self-deprecation onto the global mm. stage as a form of unnecessary modesty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where self-deprecating good, love it, and <laughs> a necessary part of my national character too, but the flip side of that, and I can say that having now spent nearly 25 years in Silicon Valley, is people are really good about telling you what they've done. Mm. They don't need to talk about punching above their weight. They will just start with the litany of things they have accomplished. Mm. And you kind of, you know, it puts you back in your chair a bit. And I think there are ways, and you know, Larry was doing a lovely job of it earlier, of reminding us what we have accomplished. Mm. You know, we ought to be proud of rust proofing wheat and worsting wool and, you know, and, 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 and all the things we have done since. Mm. And I think there's a way where we are, in fact, remarkable in the constellation of things we do both inside this country and as Australians elsewhere. And there are conversations I suspect we could be much more sort of, uh, in some ways, driving moving forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly the case that the last 20 years of technology production required things that weren't always in Australia. You know, large sums of easy capital, not that you want to say that that was true, but, you know, venture capital money, a constellation of universities and manufacturing capacity. But, you know, you look at the next 20 years of work that needs to happen, and it's not about those things necessarily. When I think about what it means, again, and I hate to keep harping on about it, but machine learning, AI, and a world of data-driven compute, those require different things, many of which we have inside this country and in our diaspora. I mean, that requires... But are we harnessing that? You know, I think not? we're getting there. I mean, I look at things like Data61 inside CSIRO. I look at the ANU, which has just kicked off its, you know, first MA and MS to sort of train people in data science. I look at some of the things that, you know, my other colleagues are doing here, and I think the pieces are there, but it's about how do you put a narrative around it that starts to make it into a conversation rather than a lot of disparate pieces. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't speak any more to the um, technical nature of it. I think you've done that quite well and, and I wouldn't call myself an expert in that part of the industry. But but I think the psychology of it is it shouldn't be played down too much. It is, it is really interesting that Australians do have that modest but also... Uh, slight tall poppy syndrome uh, happening more than most other countries. I know from my experiences um, doing a lot of judging, I, I judged at Cannes, uh, and there's a rule in place to prevent collusion across networks but also across countries. And, and uh, I know for a fact that countries like, a lot of South American countries, for example, the rule is in place so that South Americans don't vote each other's work up because they're which they'll do if, if given an opportunity, um, because the belief there is that if uh, one place does well, then it reflects well on everyone else. And if, and if one company is doing well, then we can all share in it. Um, the rule would be in place for the exact opposite reason for Australians, which is that um, there are a lot of Australian companies that feel that in order to make themselves look more successful, they have to beat down on other people, which I really find disheartening. How do you change that, do you think? Um, I think, you know, David Thode was, was talking uh, a lot about um, our lack of communication. That's, that's probably one of the biggest uh, problems. I think we, some people would consider us to be um, a second tier uh, innovation com uh, country, and, and we're definitely not. We are top tier. Um, but I think we need to communicate more with each other and, and um, start relying on each other more as opposed to relying on third parties. So much more we could talk about. Really great to 
chat with both of you. Please thank Genevieve and Imad. Thank you.